Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you on behalf of the Board of the Community Race Relations Coalition to our forum tonight on health disparities in our community. The CRRC's focus is always a local one, and our goals tonight are to share with you, uh, through our panel members, the state of health disparities in the Waco McLennan County area, and to hear from panel members how these disparities are being acknowledged and proactively addressed in their respective arenas. Our healthcare system is one of the systems we talk about when we are talking about institutionalized racism. And the CRSC recognizes that this is one of the areas in which we must be very vigilant and work to correct inequities. We're really pleased to have each of you here this evening because your being here indicates that you care about this subject and um, that you're willing to give of your time and energy to even attend this. Um, and also we know that most of you are willing to give of your time and energy beyond um, just attending a webinar. So we're very grateful to have you with us tonight. Dr. Peaches Henry, who is a CRC member and is president of the Waco chapter of the NAACP is going to be our moderator. She will be asking our panel members to address particular subjects. And then for about the last 25 minutes or so of our forum, uh, we will take questions from the audience. You can submit these questions during the whole um, evening tonight through the Q&A um, feature on Zoom. You should be able to find that, I think, usually at the bottom of your screen. And you can submit those, as I said, at any time through the Q&A um, feature. And you can also um, vote up or down on questions. So if it's a question that you would might have asked yourself, you voted up and so those may be given priority if a lot of people are interested in that, having that particular question answered. Um, these questions will be fielded by our tech person, Colwyn Green, who will then submit them to our moderator to address as she sees fit to the panel. Um, as we get started, I, I really wanted to express our deep appreciation to Colwyn Green of Cold Wind Creations for his um, technical expertise in handling the Zoom webinar for us tonight. Um, I'm so relieved that I don't have to worry about this aspect of it. Thank you, Colwyn. And so with this, I will turn this all over to Dr. Peaches Henry. Take it away, Dr. Henry. Thank you, Joe. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It is my pleasure to introduce our panel to you tonight. So we have joining us Dr. Emily Cunningham, who's the Director of Programs for Women and Children at the Waco Family Health Center. We also have Mr. Philip Patterson, who is the President of Ascension Providence Hospital here in Waco. And we have LaJana Jones, and I want to tell you from the outset that she is joining us as she is also traveling. So we will not be able to see her unless she arrives to her location before we are done. But I just wanna let you know that she is not being rude, but she is gracing us with her presence in the best way that she can. And she is the Interim Chief Nursing Officer at Baylor Scott and White Medical Center Hillcrest. We also have joining us tonight, Mr. Ferrando Arroyo, who is the Chief of Staff for the Waco Family Health Center. And then finally, we have Dr. Lauren Barron, who is joining us. She is the Family Practices Physician and Adjunct at Baylor, uh, an adjunct Baylor professor. Thank the panel for joining us tonight. And I wanna chat with you just a little bit about why we are here tonight. Among the many difficult lessons that COVID-19 has taught us, one important lesson is that there are deep health disparities in our community. Indeed, underlying the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on people of color are the health disparities in our community. What we know through research and data is that these inequities are all tied to race. People of color are less likely to receive adequate pain management. They're less likely to receive lab tests when necessary. They are less have less access to high quality care. 
people of color are likely to be less listened to when they complain about their medical complaints. And in fact, people of color are more likely to be deemed aggressive when they complain about the medical care that they are getting. And we're all aware that women of color are two to three times more likely to die from pregnancy-related causes than white women, no matter their socioeconomic levels. So there are various reasons for these, but we, we are aware that there are systemic inequities that exist that are due to systemic racism, implicit bias, lack of awareness, economic disparities, and other reasons. Now, we know that we can't solve all of these problems tonight, but we do have a set of goals. We want to have a conversation in our community and we want to increase awareness of the existence of disparities in healthcare. You cannot deal with a problem that you do not know about or do not acknowledge. And we wanna hear from the two local hospitals and the Family Health Center on these issues. Are they aware of the disparities? How are they addressing and trying to remedy these disparities? So those are our goals for tonight. But by way of introduction, to illustrate what we mean when we talk about racial disparities, we want to show you a brief video about Dr. Susan Moore, a family physician who graduated from the University of Michigan Medical School, but who was also a black woman. She died from COVID in December. And before dying, she videotaped herself and explained how the white doctor treating her made her feel like a drug addict when she asked for more medicine for her pain, even though he knew she was a physician. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As the United States reports world record deaths and hospitalizations from COVID-19, in the final days of 2020, we look at how the pandemic that's ravaged the country this year has shown stark new light on racism in medical care. We begin with a now viral video recorded by black physician Dr. Susan Moore and posted to her Facebook earlier this month, in which she describes racist treatment by medical staff at a hospital in Indianapolis who did not respond to her pleas for care despite being in intense pain and being a doctor herself. Dr. Moore says she had to beg to receive the antiviral drug remdesivir and pain medication and accuses a doctor at Indiana University Health North Hospital of ignoring her pleas because she was black. This is Dr. Susan Moore, as she summoned the energy to speak from her hospital bed days before she would die. She had an os oxygen tube in her nose. At that time, I'd only received two treatments of the remdesivir. He said, ah, oh, you don't need it. You're not even short of breath. I said, yes, I am. Then he went on to say, you don't qualify for myself because um, I've gotten two treatments. And then he further stated, you should just go home right now. And I don't feel comfortable giving you any more narcotics. I was in so much pain from my neck. My neck hurt so bad. I was crushed. He made me feel like I was a drug addict. And he knew I was a physician. I don't take narcotics. I was hurt. So I spoke to patient advocate 
who left me wanting. Um, there's not much I can do. So I started asking, send me to another hospital where they can treat me. And if they're not gonna treat me here properly, send me to another hospital. Next thing I know, I'm getting a stat. CT of my neck with and without contrast. The CT went down a little bit into my lungs and you could see new pulmonary infiltrates, new uh, lymphadenopathy all throughout my neck. And all of a sudden, yes, we'll treat your pain. You have to show proof that you have something wrong with you in order for you to get the medicine. I put forward and I maintain, if I was white, I wouldn't have to go through that. The other thing that that white Dr. Bannock said was that if I stayed, that he would send me home Saturday at 10 p.m. in the dark. Who does that? On a week, who does that? This is how black people get killed when you send them home and they don't know how to fight for themselves. I had to talk to somebody, maybe the media, somebody, to let people know how I'm being treated up in this place. And he gladly told me, I know you're a doctor. So he didn't want the black doctor to have no medicine, nothing. And then, had the nerve to say, it's because of him, the nurse, that I got the medicine. Really? Because of you? No. How about because I had that stat CT in my neck where it showed all of that lymphadenopathy and, and infiltrates? Yeah, you didn't know about that? You didn't get that in report? That's what I said. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To being black up in here, this is what happens. Dr. Susan Moore died due to complications from COVID-19 on December 20th, just over two weeks after she recorded this video and posted it to her Facebook page. She was 52 years old. Her 19-year-old son, Henry Muhammad, is now left to care for her parents, who are both suffering from dementia. The president and CEO of Indiana University Health issued a statement in response to her death, saying the technical aspects of the treatment she received, quote, may not have shown the level of compassion and respect we strive for in understanding what matters most to patients, unquote. Dr. Moore's chilling message has been compared to the video of George Floyd begging for his life as he was killed by Minneapolis police. When we come back, we'll speak to two leading black women doctors fighting racial disparities in health care. They co-wrote a piece in The Washington Post titled, Say Her Name, Dr. Susan Moore. Stay with us. Uh, Dr. Cunningham. Thank you, Dr. Henry. Um, I think it's important when we're talking or looking at disparities to realize that there are several ways that those disparities manifest. So you can have differences in the incidence of how this occurs, but also in the severity, of course, fatalities and the survival rates differ. But then also consider mitigation or, or you know, think of them like protective factors. So uh, an individual might have built up multiple risk factors that kind of synergize and exacerbate what those symptoms or what the, how it affects quality of life, or conversely, protective factors, which can work together and kind of depress what, how um, the condition would manifest. So it, there's just a number of ways that it, it's um, expressed. So consider that. Um, I have a few slides of data. If, if that's stressful to you, just glaze over. My segment will be short, but it's so important because the data states the case, right? Um, my world is women and children, so a commonly cited statistic is preterm birth. This is Waco 2015 from uh, state data, and we see that big gap between uh, Black and Hispanic and white women. Um, and, and like Dr. Henry cited earlier, the, this data, that gap, we see again and again, whether it's maternal mortality 
or uh, severe morbidity. Um, it's irrespective of education and income level. So that uh, maternal mortality rates, those, um, you know, the, the, the outcomes are worse for college educated black women versus white women that don't have a high school degree. So we can confidently look at that and, and call it for what it is, that it's uh, that racism is the risk factor and, and not race. Also noteworthy, you know, this is local data. I tried to stay local, um, but we don't have data more recent than 2015. So we can't really put a finger on the problem unless we're tracking it. Um, but I do say, I, I cite these kind of statistics because this is something, it's the common ground that we can all agree on. We look at this gap and the word crisis is appropriately used to, to in, in describing that. Um, uh, another significant one stood out to me, children living in households, 100% of the federal poverty level, um, that figure is 13% for um, white children versus 50% for black. I chose this one because it really tells, uh, it, it speaks to a, a deeper story of the impact of um, historical racism and how it inhibited the transfer of generational wealth. And so something um, started many years ago, we're still seeing the effects of that. <clears throat> um, this figure is from the Community Health Needs Assessment published in 2019, um, emergency department visit rate by race for McLennan County. So we see significantly higher emergency department visits um, by black residents of the county. Um, and this also tells a deeper story, right? Because um, higher emergency department usage is associated with not having a relationship established with a primary care provider, um, not having access to preventative care. It's so important in, in influencing long-term outcomes. <clears throat> when we transition to looking at the effects of COVID-19, um, the fatalities, if you, and this, I pulled this from covidwaco.com. So this is the county level fatality um, demographics. They, you know, fairly resemble our population demographics. Um, but if we, so I tried to look at some FHC data and I know that over the course of COVID we've seen consistently higher positivity rates among our Hispanic community and there's, um, risk factors associated with that. So um, the prevalence we've seen disparities. And what's also important to note about that is our patients at something like 96% live at 200% of the federal poverty line or below. And um, so, you know, in, in, if we look at our patient data, we're controlling for income, right? And we can see that the prevalence tells a much different story than just the county at large. <clears throat> Thanks to Joe for sending me this, um, some new research that came out in December of 2020, looking at life expectancy. And you can see um, the predictions for life expectancy, expectancy changes due to COVID. Um, now, the gap has been there for, for decades, but we saw since the year 2000 that it was narrowing somewhat. Um, what is devastating about COVID is the gains that have been made since, say, 2006. Um, we see they are likely to be completely eroded, so pushing us back so much in terms of the disparities in life expectancy. Finally, um, perhaps you saw the article in the Waco Trib this weekend. It was on Saturday. So looking at the county's first public vaccine clinic that was offered last week, and they reported um, vaccinations by zip code. Um, so here are the top zip codes and by just crude numbers of uptake. And so this light blue and the orange um, wedges, uh, those are zip codes located in West Waco. Um, so something totaling close to 500 vaccines versus the five, you can see that little green slice that um, of residents located in 76704 or 33 in the zip code 76707. So a very significant difference. And I feel like um, 
as far as data, this offers a, a real time snapshot of health inequity, like happening right now. Um, so thank you. Thank you for that data, Dr. Cunningham. We want to turn now to uh, the two local hospitals, and we want to ask the representative of, of those two hospitals to address your role in remedying disparities and any proactive steps that are being taken within your systems to address the issue. And I'd like to start with um, the president of Ascension Providence, uh, Mr. Philip Patterson. Mr. Patterson. Thank you, Dr. Henry. I appreciate that. Uh, good evening. Uh, again, I'm Philip Patterson, the president of Ascension Providence. And as we all have experienced in some way, we faced a global pandemic um, for this whole year and the extreme challenge of, of the individuals, particularly all, across all the health systems. Um, and the good news is, as uh, you heard, uh, for Dr. Cunningham is, is the future is bright because the vaccines will continue to arrive and continue to progress across our communities. If Ascension Providence continues to receive additional doses of those uh, COVID-19 vaccines, we hope to expand our operations and work with our partners at the FQHC at Hillcrest, uh, as well as the public health department to getting closer to making that vaccine more widely available to our communities we serve. Um, for now, we are all um, caught within the expectation of both the federal government as well as the state of Texas about how that delivery system continues to push out. First, 1A uh, is all of those who are on the front lines, our staff, as well as those others in the community that we are utilizing uh, and allowing uh, access to those uh, those vaccines, those who are in independent emergency departments, uh, freestanding ones, our EMS, our firefighters, our police. Um, but however, you know, it, it's no doubt that the challenges that uh, were brought on by COVID brought opportunities for change. And we know that those changes uh, exist and should have been probably uh, addressed earlier. Um, but we've continued to look at that and continue to evaluate ourselves. And this is a great way to continue our evaluation. One major opportunity for change is brought, that's been brought on by this pandemic is for health systems to reflect on how we're providing access to and delivering health care to the underserved communities. We know that COVID-19 virus continues to disproportionately uh, impact Latinx and African-American communities. In fact, uh, Waco, the McLennan County Public Health District, reports that 30% of COVID cases are Hispanic, 9% are African American. So in terms of fatalities, if you want to just take that one step further, 22% are Hispanic and 14% are African American. According to the CDC regarding COVID cases, race and ethnicity are risk factors for other underlying conditions that affect health, including socioeconomic status, uh, access to health care, uh, and exposure to virus related to occupation. Racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic related disparities in health care and outcomes have been reported for years now across multiple conditions. COVID-19 has just highlighted and amplified these disparities. We at Ascension Providence are committed to serving all people with a special attention to those who are poor and vulnerable. Our Catholic Health Ministry is dedicated to spiritual-centered, holistic care, which sustains and improves the health of individuals and our communities. We are advocates for a compassionate and just society through our actions as well as our words. Ascension Providence is proud of our relationships with our local not-for-profit organizations that support this effort across our community by closing the gap in health disparity disparities we tirelessly work together to make Waco and McLennan County an equitably healthy community. Ascension Providence partners with the Family Health Center on many levels from uh, support of the residency program to sharing uh, all of our resources include COVID vaccines to ensure that patients in their clinics have the same opportunity to receive uh, vaccines as anyone else. The FQHC clinics are housed in specifically zones that we should be focused in and should be looking at. 
Um, and they are a key to providing medical, dental, and health, mental health care uh, to the working poor and those with limited or no insurance. Our financial support helps offset their losses. One of the largest populations within our community are, are individuals suffering from mental health. Mental health has been exacerbated tremendously by the current COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, and we are on the front stages of mental health and, and, and working with uh, our community. Daily, we work with the Waco uh, Police Department as well as the McLennan County Sheriff's Office to keep those suffering from mental health episodes out of our local jail and to help them get the care they desperately need. Ascension Providence and the DePaul Center on our campus work closely with the Heart of Texas Region Mental Health and Mental Retardation System to provide direct care services to those individuals, many of whom are unable to pay for the care that they receive. With our Ascension Medical Group clinics, all patients are screened by Nurse Navigator for social determinants of health. Our clinical program director of our Care for Texans uh, um, Accountable Care Organization also currently serves as the co-chair for the Access to Care Committee under Prosper Waco. In this committee for the year 2021, we have divided those that work into four areas, access to medical care and social resources, coverage, meaning insurance or medical for both medical and prescription services, as well as mental health, communication and information sources, and diversity and inclusion on building in the workforce. Ascension Providence is proud to support many of the not-for-profit organizations in Waco, including Habitat for Humanity, which helps families build homes. And as we know, have a clean, safe home is what is for, for improving of health and the well-being of families. We work with CareNet, uh, whose uh, collaboration uh, with Women's Health is tremendous uh, in, in providing those on-site obstetrics uh, as well as secondary care uh, through our midwives and our ultrasound uh, provided, but a, a tremendous opportunity to work with that group. Uh, Caritas and Mission Waco, we support with food and monetary donations throughout the year. Um, they provide a host of services to the poor and vulnerable by providing food and social services. Um, and as one of the local healthcare providers, it's, res it's responsibility to work with community leaders to provide ways to continue to help our neighbors uh, to stay safe and healthy. And we continue as we continue to live with the virus uh, in our local communities. I hope this discussion and questions I can answer uh, will be a continued focus and shed light on additional opportunities that our local healthcare system can continue to expand healthcare for all those individuals across Central Texas. So Dr. Henry, thank you for the opportunity to give me or give my thoughts as well as my organization's direction. Uh, we continue to uh, work and provide those uh, opportunities uh, and partnerships. And we look forward to this discussion on how we can continue to expand those operations as well as that support to help uh, close those disparity gaps. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Patson, for that one down of the kind of work that you're doing in the community. And let me pause here for a moment and ask our attendees, if you have any questions for any of our panelists, please put your questions in the question and answer link. Uh, please do not put them in the chat because the chat is moving and we have uh, less ability to keep up with your questions. So any questions that you have for any of our panelists, put them in that in the question and answer. If you want them directed at a particular panelist, please indicate that as well. In addition to that, if you'll take a look in the chat box, we have posted the video of Dr. Moore in case you were not able to see or hear that. I think that it's well worth a, a, a look. So take a look at it. So let's move on now. And I would like to um, hear from Ms. Lawana Jones, who remember she's not showing her, us her face because she is traveling, but she's going to talk to us about uh, what Baylor Scott and White Health Hillcrest oh, yeah. are, are doing. <laughs> okay, Ms. Jones, take it away. And we can hear you.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to uh, move on to Mr. Arroyo. It sounds like Ms. Jones had some excellent information, but she's just got a bad connection, and that's just not her fault. It's the fault of technology. So we're going to go ahead and move on to the Family, family Health Center, and we're going to ask the Chief of Staff there, Fernando Arroyo, uh, to please talk to us about those same issues. Mr. Arroyo? Yeah, absolutely. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right, wonderful. My name is Fernando Roy. I'm with the Family Health Center. We provide high quality primary care, mental health, dental care to all patients without regard to their ability to pay. Uh, we provide care to the whole person, prioritizing values of compassion, respect, equity, and clinical excellence. And um, in early reports uh, around the COVID-19 incidents uh, uh, showed that there were going to be some disproportionate uh, uh, effects for our black and brown population, for our black brothers and sisters, for our brown brothers and sisters. And immediately, Family Health Center assembled an internal uh, stakeholders team uh, of, of, from all the strata of the organization, from front desk to, um, to, to physicians and administrators. And we, we, we continued the, the race equity work that, that was going on, but pivoted to address what we were seeing was about to happen and what we know now uh, has happened. We began to update our, our content relevant to, to our community around cultural responsiveness and around implicit bias, making it mandatory training for everyone across the whole organization and to provide accountability regarding the distribution of the testing among the Family Health Center uh, patients uh, we we began to provide a, a weekly data report to our external stakeholders. That included Councilwoman Andrea Bearfield, Councilman Hector Sabido. Uh, it also included Commissioner uh, Pat Chisholm Miller and a number of other uh, co uh, community stakeholders who had an, an interest and, and were invested in the Black and Brown community, all the community, but but especially for for those who were experiencing the disproportionate impacts around initially around, around testing. Now we began to uh, recognize that many, uh, pa many patients were not getting the kind of care that they received uh, because everything was shutting down. So we stood up tent clinics. Uh, we, we began to implement telehealth and one huge equity component that, that we stood up was, uh, was partnering with a transformation Waco school so that the students there were in the, who were in the classroom, when they went to the nurse and the nurse said, you know what, you, you need to see a doctor. We had, there was an iPad or a computer right there so that the, the student could immediately talk within five, five to 10, no more than 15 minutes, talk to a doctor. Uh, whether the kid was insured, uninsured uh, or, or underinsured. It was uh, really important for us too to recognize that equity would need to be embedded across the organization. And some of the work that I, I and others were able to do is to make sure that, that, that equity was a part of our global organizational strategy. It's critical that all levels of the organization, equity, especially uh, health equity, including issues around race are embedded into every aspect of our organization, not just a silo, a department, a group, or, or even a person handling equity, but across the whole organization. That in accounting, there's an equity piece. That means partnering for supplies with organizations that are historically underused businesses, right? Uh, uh, whether it's in, in clinical, uh, issues, clinical concerns uh, regarding diabetes and another other of, uh, of illnesses that uh, that that are also part of the social determinants of, of, of health uh, concerns. Uh, whether it's um, uh, uh, organizational, you know, how are we doing training? How are we doing development? How are we doing uh, a number of other things? Now, I, I want to point out one one quick little uh, uh, example of a type of operational issue that deals with the systemic uh, issue around race equity that I, I think is, is, a, is a proud moment for, for me and, and our organization. When the testing was first around and there was a, a, a series of decisions on whether I should, you know, a clinician should test someone or not regarding um, uh, COVID, there was a little question there that said, has the person traveled? Has the person traveled? Now, and, you know, by itself, without the context, 
there is no indication that this could be uh, a, a tool towards uh, inequities, a tool towards uh, disproportionate impact in receiving tests for, for our uh, population of, of, of color. But that question itself created a gap between those who were tested and those who were not tested. And so our little group gathering together, looking at the data, disaggregating it because population data and research can skew and can hide the, the disproportionate uh, uh, impact and inequities, um, we were able to, to see that very clearly that that question was impacting who got tested and who, got, who didn't get tested. So we did a few things. We removed that question. We talked to our clinicians and began to discuss the importance of, of, of equitable testing across the, the demographics, uh, show them their stats. Uh, it, it was not punitive at all, not, not at all. Uh, again, it, everyone is doing the very best they can. As a, as a matter of fact, uh, equity is ingrained in the essence of, of the priorities of our organization. And along with that, we, we began to, to ask, why should we not test them instead of why should we test them? So that, that, that little reframing did something and it converged our and closed the gap between those who were tested and not tested. And those are the types of things that one person perhaps, uh, uh, I mean, one person perhaps could not be uh, 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 doing something that may seem like it contributes, but there's a systemic issue too. Now, now why travel? Because many of those in our population do not travel. Mm -hmm. They didn't travel. However, they were frontline workers. They were in proximity to the virus. They were working in the service industry. They were, uh, 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 you know, mowing lawns. They were inside cleaning homes. So many other, so many other, uh, uh, other reasons. But those are the types of things that are super important for the Family Health Center, and that we prioritize the equitable um, application of, of testing, but also care. That we stop, that we listen, uh, and that we look at uh, not only the interpersonal things, but also the systemic things. There's a question here. Well, we're, okay, we're going to wait I, for the we're going to wait for the questions. Okay, okay, and I believe I answered the question. It was what, how did travel skew the, mm -hmm. the the inequity, and and it was that it was that our many of our patients did not travel. However, they not were travel. very much in proximity to the virus. Thank you so much. Okay, everyone, I want to remind you again: if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the question and answer. Um, I guess we're going to call it a box. We're getting very close to uh, responding to questions. So go ahead and queue your questions up as we get ready to address those. Now I want to uh, bring Dr. Lauren Barron into the conversation. She's going to talk to us about a course that she and Dr. Stephanie Body are offering. Dr. Body can't be with us tonight, but Dr. Barron is going to talk about the course, its goals and its scope. Uh, please, Dr. Barron. Take it away. <clears throat> thank you so much, um, Dr. Henry, and thank you for inviting me to this panel. It's uh, wonderful to be in, a, even if it's a Zoom room, it's wonderful to be in a room mm -hmm. with um, colleagues and uh, friends that I admire and respect that are working toward this issue all over the city. Um, this summer, uh, with the killing of George Floyd and the confluence with the COVID crisis, um, I realized that I couldn't think of a better topic for a course than to spend an entire semester talking about how, to, how we can disrupt racial disparities in healthcare. And so um, I had never met Dr. Stephanie Body before, but uh, she took my call. And the next thing you knew, we were partners in uh, teaching this class called Disrupting Racial Disparities in Healthcare. Um, it's the first time it's been taught. Uh, we have 30 students and a waiting list. Um, and uh, we're using this textbook called Race, Ethnicity, uh, and Health, a Public Health Reader. And we wanted to make sure that this course was not just uh, passive, that we weren't just, you know, the students just weren't sitting and absorbing information. So um, 
We are planning to partner with Prosper Waco to help Prosper Waco complete profiles on agencies around town who are working on this issue to help fill out their policy maps. They have a backlog of agencies that they would like to have profiles on. And so our students are gonna be engaging with the community and each one will be assigned one of those agencies and will work to make sure that it's um, put into the Waco Roundtable, which is a fabulous resource if you haven't seen it. Um, in addition to that, even that wasn't enough. I mean, we want to, um, with this class, we really want our students to acquire fluency with the terminology used to talk about these issues. We want them to be trained in civil discourse and how to have courteous conversations about um, the issue of racism. Um, we're, the fact that it's an interdisciplinary course, you know, people talk a lot about interdisciplinary teaching and learning, but it's hard to pull off. So that's another aspect of it. Um, I, can hardly, I can't hardly take care of patients without um, having a partner who's a social worker. I, I, it's just almost impossible to take care of the medical issues. And so um, I think another really important part of the course is uh, we wanna model how important it is to have interdisciplinary teams. We're also talking about implicit bias and uh, we're talking about the ecosystem of organizations that are working toward this. And we want them to be fully prepared to go out and advocate in whatever healthcare systems they're in. And in addition to the, um, to the course, um, I'm gonna share this with you now. Um, we wanted to do something else um, along with the course. Are you able to see that screen? Yes, we are. Good. Um, in addition to the course, we uh, wanted to do something else um, that was, uh, you know, again, not passive and a way to engage with the community. And so we've partnered with the Office of External Affairs at Baylor and we're launching this, we're part of this series called Envisioning Equity. And um, we're really excited about it because the, um, the, uh, editor of this textbook is going to be one of our very first speakers. Okay. And he's going to be next, he's going to be speaking next week. So I wanted to invite everybody here um, who would like to come to talk about the role of structural racism in COVID-19 inequities um, from exposure to, va to vaccination. This is Dr. Tom Leviste, and he's the Dean of the School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine at Tulane. So we are delighted to have him come not just for our class, I mean, come on, you know, he edited the textbook. So that's a pretty <laughs> awesome way to start the semester, but also to make his um, talk available to the whole community. In addition, these are the other dates and times. Um, and uh, you don't need to remember this because I'm going to tell you where to go to find it. But Dr. Paul Song, Dr. Linda Ray Murray, Dr. Renee Creeslow, and uh, Dr. Michael Spencer, these are all um, very renowned experts in the field that are actually out there getting it done, you know, not just talking about it, but getting it done. And um, you're welcome to join us. And we would love to have as many people from the community as possible. And all you have to do is um, if you follow solid, at Solid Gold Neighbor um, at Instagram or Facebook, that'll put you in contact or you can go to the external affairs website at Baylor tomorrow. It's not up yet but go to the community leadership tab and then you'll see the envisioning equity tab. And that way you can register for this um, uh, lecture series. And um, we, we're still taking registration for Dr. Levice uh, talk on January the 29th. Um, and uh, there's even CEUs for social workers. Okay, so thank you so much for letting me tell you about this. We are so excited. And uh, I wish Dr. Body could be here today because she honored me with the term co-conspirator. So I'm really <laughs> excited about that. So we're co-conspirators in this course. So thank you very much. We're so happy to hear that this is a conversation that is going on all around our city because we think that it is, is very important. And so um, we are now at the point where we can begin to take questions 
And um, I am going to hope that I am following the technology correctly as I open up questions. And uh, if these questions are directed at what at, at a particular person, I will indicate that, okay? And then if not, um, then we'll just have uh, anyone who wants to, to jump in. So I'm gonna read this one and it says here, once additional or adequate COVID vaccine doses are available, what changes or adjustments are needed to ensure that all segments of our population receive the vaccine in a timely and equitable manner? As Dr. Cunningham demonstrated, the current strategy isn't working for all Waco McLennan County residents. Those residents in technology internet deserts have a hard time getting into the vaccination queue. And no particular person is addressed here. So I'm gonna have uh, either of the panelists who wants to, to, to respond to that. So again, the main question is, once we get more doses of the vaccine, what changes are needed to ensure that all segments of the population actually receive the vaccine? Um, I know that uh, marketing is a key part of the answer of that question. It's such a great example of inequity at work, right? Because you could say, well, what? We put the link out there. So it's open access to anybody. What do you mean? Where's the problem? But it's really, it's, it's going that extra step and figuring out well, what does this population need? to make it equitable and to, to, to do your homework and to do the legwork to, um, to, to bridge that gap. And, and it does require extra thinking and extra forethought to make that happen. Um, but it, it would be something in marketing and, and making sure that um, that resource is available immediately in, in a way that that community is, has access to it. Thank you for that. Anyone else want to jump in on that? I should also say that um, uh, Dr. Uh, Ms. Jones is still with us. And in some cases, she's going to be typing some answers. And if she does, I'm going to read those answers when she types them. Um, let's go to another question, which I think is particularly important. What are some actionable items we can leave this discussion with? What can people who are not directly involved in the healthcare field do to help impact? And um, I'm going to answer myself because I've actually been in conversations about this and then invite others of you to do so as well. One of the suggestions that was made to me as I was having conversations is for those of us who do have access, that is those of us who do have access to the internet, that we, we would reach out to vulnerable communities, to our neighbors and people such as that, and help them get registered when we know that there's going to be an opportunity. And it looks as though we won't have access in too much ahead of time. And so when those of us who do find out about it, we can actually reach out and, and help that older neighbor, for example, uh, to get registered, to talk with them about it. So that's one thing. Uh, would other panelists like to jump in as well? I can share a few things. Please. <laughs> Before here, I was doing a little bit of organizing and, and some of the things that, that uh, this is Fernando Royal, some of the, the, the things that I'll share, you'll be familiar with. Um, one of them is practicing cultural humility, which means committing to a lifelong process of self-evaluation, of self-critique, the, uh, uh, the desire to fix power imbalances, for instance, between providers and clients. Uh, developing community partnerships like many of you are already doing to advocate within the larger organizations in, in which we participate. Another thing is promoting social norms of inclusion, of equity, of respect, which means, uh, which means educating or, or, or educate or legislate to change social norms. It means observing and challenging, challenging or implicit bias, biases. It means evaluating and breaking down unnecessary hierarchies that, that exist. Uh, it also means to advocate for racially equitable public policies. It's really important. That there's, there's a quote by Rudolf Virchow that says, medicine is a social science and politics is nothing else but medicine on a large scale. So taking action around policies that impact many of, of, our, of our black and brown brothers and sisters 
take action beyond the walls of the clinics and hospitals and the treatment centers to advocate for policies that address social determinants of mental health and of health in general. Three, communicate with elected officials and promote equitable representation, form cross-sector collaborations across the, the, the community. And simply to leave you with this, speak up, take a stand, do something. There's a quote that says, if you see something that is not right, that is not fair, that is not just, you have a moral obligation to do something about do something. It. Thank you. So let's move to the next question. Several speakers have mentioned social determinants of health, which is a crucial part of addressing health disparities. Any one organization tackling these can very easily stretch themselves thin. What resources, funding, partnerships, or programs, et cetera, are available in the community for addressing these SDOH? And what resources are still needed for Waco? And that's, of course, social determinants of health. Dr. Well, Henry, I can if you want me to. Please do. That's Mr. Patterson. Go ahead, Mr. Patterson. You know, I would agree that one individual organization, whether it's a private organization such as myself or even public organizations, would definitely stretch themselves trying to answer what is obviously a large problem with across the United States, but also here in Waco. And I think it talks about how we really have to work together because pooling our resources and working across systematic issues in our community is the way I think to bring it into a focal point that works. One area about that, and I think is, is really hard to, or really easy to, 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 um, to talk about is, is Prosper Waco. Uh, I'm new to Waco for the most part, but one of that areas is, is the community health resource uh, individuals that we have working in the five most uh, critically uh, disparate areas uh, by uh, zip codes. Um, and each of our physician offices, as well as our emergency departments, immediately have a resource that they can link these individuals who work in these zip codes with the uh, community individuals who are seeking care to help address some of their socioeconomic issues as well as their health issues to help curb whatever is determining a need for health if it can be resolved through other means. We all know that dentistry, <laughs> health uh, issues, but that also socioeconomic issues all determine a health quotient. Uh, and so it's not always the direct medical care you need, but what can you do to systemically change that individual's life uh, to focus their health and really truly bring them up to a different health quotient? So I think a lot of work has gone on uh, when it comes to that work because it, it really directs many of the different not-for-profits into a focused point of truly working together to change the, uh, the, the stratus of those people within Waco. So, you know, specifically to that point, what can they do? It, resources are not always about putting money at a situation. We are always looking for volunteers. We're looking for individuals uh, to learn about what resources are in their community and helping to expand the knowledge across individuals that they may think could help uh, from those. Um, you know, it, it's specific. If you think about individual organizations like Habitat for Humanity, like Mission Waco, uh, you know, those individuals, uh, organizations do the best they can through getting their message out. But individuals, there's so much opportunity out there. And I think it's about talking about resources that are available across organizations. So the more knowledgeable you are and the more you want to volunteer, I think those opportunities do exist and, and the resources are finite, unfortunately, and, and we can all do more uh, as a community to support and raise the tide across our uh, entire community. I think in the past few years, there's been a new spirit of cooperation between agencies in Waco that I haven't seen before. I've been here 30 years. In the past few years, there's been this new spirit of more networking, more linking up, more relationships, more participation. And so 
that um, energy predated COVID. And then when COVID came along, you know, it had to be ramped up to the max immediately. Um, so um, I, I just want to say that I think that there, there are amazing people in Waco and we're also blessed to have a town the size where we can know who to call, to pick up the phone and who to call. And um, mm -hmm. so I am really, um, you know, I don't want to be overly, um, <clears throat> overly uh, sort of excited and happy and gleeful and uh, considering everything that's going on right now. But I do think there's a increasing synergy between all of these organizations and uh, we need to work smarter and not duplicate each other's efforts and um, you know, use that synergy in the best possible way. Thank you for that. Before I take another question, I want to ask uh, Joe Welter to, to share some information that she has. Go ahead, Joe. I wanted to address, I think that um, programs and um, efforts on the part of organizations to, to um, remedy things in a certain way, is, are, th those are important. Um, but I, you know, I, I had a conversation this afternoon with Kelly Crane of the Waco McClendon County Health District, and I also reached out to our mayor, Dylan Meek, um, who is, is, was, and still is in a city council meeting. However, um, he found that took the time to um, text me with a message um, after I, I texted him back and, and told him kind of what, what was going on. Um, I will not have a chance until tomorrow to share my perspective with him, which he has asked for, but I thought I may, would maybe read this since this, the, this disparity with the COVID vaccines is so much on our minds right now and it's such a glaring um, disparity. And I think, you know, we, we are aware and have addressed some of the reasons uh, why it is, you know, um, differences in availability of technology and things like that. Um, but I thought I would read this and then kind of address um, before I talk to him, my perspective and the perspective that I shared with um, Kelly Crane today. So Mayor Meek said, the public health district is but one of over 20 vaccine providers in Waco, HEB, CVS, Brookshire's um, hospital. Oh my gosh, okay. I just did something to my phone and made it difficult to read here. Um, so anyway, there are various providers um, available in the city um, besides McLennan County. Our focus is on, on McLennan, um, you know, what's happening kind of with the powers that be in wake of McLennan County. Um, and one of the two vaccine uh, hubs located in, uh, oh, and anyway, one of two vaccines is located in McLennan County. We continue to encourage eligible residents to seek out vaccine availability at all of the providers in the area. We are, but, but we are by far the most transparent and the most publicly accessible vaccination providers in the county. We have worked hard to quickly distribute all vaccine allocation. And let's admit, I mean, I think that in, on the one hand, we need to be patient uh, about this because our local authorities have no control uh, whatsoever over um, the supply. And the supply is a huge issue. So first of all, we at the CRC would encourage people to be patient. On the other hand, um, patience is, does, shouldn't go on forever. Um, and when we do have the available uh, vaccine, then we would like to see some changes made. Ultimately, we need access to larger allocations of the vaccine. We have over 50, 15,000 people trying to access 1,500 doses. We continue to advocate um, to the state the significant need for vaccines in our community. And I think we can all acknowledge and know that they, the, the powers that be in our city are, are working on that. Not being defensive on any of this, know that we need to get better committed to doing that, exclamation mark. Just wanted to give you some information. We'll call tomorrow and catch up on some things I want your perspective. So let me tell you the perspective of the Community Race Relations Coalition. 
The most important thing, and again, acknowledging that programs and policies are very important. The most important thing really is to make people feel valued. And that is something that in the 30 some years that I've been in this community, I have not seen done. We've had various programs, Vision 2000, Vision 2020, and I've been part of um, you know, the community meetings where, where the powers that be are asking for everyone's input. I have been part of, and I can't remember which one it was, if it was 2010, Vision 2010, Vision 2020. Um, and I've talked about this on various panels. I, I went, they had three separate meetings. I was part of one at the Multipurpose Center in Waco and it was filled and we were at round tables um, often with, with people who didn't know each other and we were given a map of the city and these little monopoly kind of things, bicycles and such that we could put, just brainstorming, what would we like to, what was our vision for how our community should look with various you know things in place and these little um, uh, uh, monopoly type things that we could put in the various places. And at the end of the evening, we um, each table shared what they had, had come up with. And amazingly that night, I, first of all, you could feel it in the air that people really believed that they were asking, that their voice mattered and that they were asking truly sincerely for their input. And at the end of the evening, when everyone from the different sh tables who had no collaboration with each other at all, um, shared what, what they had come up with, the focus was tremendously on East Waco. And it was almost a magical night. I do, not what, I do not know what happened at the other two locations for these meetings that they held. Um, but I know that that night, people really were excited about this. And especially people in East Waco. And of course, the Multipurpose Center is located in East Waco. So a lot of the attendees that night were from that area. And um, a few days later, the boom is dropped. And in the paper, in the, the headline in the Waco trip was basically the powers that be had decided that we would focus on the other side of the river, not the east side of the river, and we'd let it trickle over to the east side of the river. And it was just, in my opinion, another slap in the face um, to, the, to a, a, an important community of color and um, something that was very expected and very offensive once again. And, you know, we're coming from an area in Central Texas here that had um, used a, the lynching culture, had a lynching culture that existed as a, to means, as a means of social control. And it's just kind of gone on and on from there, just as it has in our nation. When one thing doesn't work, there's another way to oppress people. And I just, I was so exasperated and so disappointed. So now we have another situation here where we have identified in this, this amazing graph um, that, that, that the city and county have been very upfront about. Um, we have the, you know, a, a limited supply of vaccine and this is what has happened. I very strongly feel, and the CRC advocates, that we use our voices to encourage our Waco, and count, uh, Waco City um, and, count, and County to make vulnerable communities within our bigger community a priority. It is always amazing to me what a difference it makes in people in their ability to lift themselves up and to make a difference even for themselves when they feel valued. And I think it's wonderful that we have made a priority of healthcare workers who are exposed and vulnerable and have made a priority of nursing home residents who are trapped and vulnerable. I really feel very strongly that we have to reach out and make our black brothers and sisters and our Latino brothers and sisters a priority and go out of our way to pour the resources, in this case, our, our supply of vaccine and make it, make it a priority to be available to them. We do not have to do vaccines at the, at the convention center. 
and there are, I know, you know, after my, my talking with Kelly Crane today and Peaches has shared with me that she has spoken with some other um, player stakeholders and the, the powers that be that, you know, they, they are bringing up, well, you know, we have to have a place large enough and we have to have a place where people can go after they're vaccinated to sit for 15 minutes and think there are churches and there are buildings, there are community centers that are large enough to do this. Let's, let's make them our priority and show them for the first time, in my humble opinion, in my 30 some years here, that they are valued and that we care about them. And so it, it puts a different light completely on programs and policies that we have if people feel valued. What happens when people don't feel valued and are um, addressed with programs and policies only is they feel like the do-gooders are, do are coming in to fix them. And I think this is a maybe you know, symptom of a lack of being in touch with who we really want to serve and we really want to include. And I would encourage every one of you and some of the questions that have come in uh, are addressing what, you know, what can I do? What are some actionable items? Let the powers that be in our city and council and county government know that we want to reach out, that I am willing to go unvaccinated in order to, to do this in order to make our vulnerable populations within our community a priority. And I'm going to stop talking now. That's my two cents on this. And I did want to share what the mayor had said. I have not had a chance to have a conversation, personal conversation with him um, yet about this. And this is exactly what I'm going to tell him tomorrow. I'm very aware that a huge problem is the availability um, of the supply of vaccine. Once that is solved though, I'm going to be as vocal as I possibly can personally about making our Black and Latino brothers and sisters the highest priority because they are the most vulnerable regarding this situation with COVID-19. Thank you so much. Thanks, Joe. And so as we are continuing our conversation tonight, I think that we have all the time issues of disparity that exist, but I think that COVID-19 has exposed those in ways that are very sharp and real for us. This is very practical. It is uh, very clear for us to be able to see who got the vaccination and who did not get the vaccination. So these issues are really issues that have always existed, but are now coming to the forefront, they're bubbling up to the top. And so let me um, point out a couple of more questions that really are connected to that, that. So for example, we have this question, is there effort being made to reach fast food, hotels, Uber, et cetera, where workers come into contact with those traveling to be informed when testing will be available? Are they being moved up in when they can get vaccinated? And so um, I'm gonna ask Dr. Barron if she can respond to that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Peach, Dr. Henry, but I, I think I'm gonna pass to um, my colleague, Dr. Fernando Arroyo. I think he, uh -oh. <laughs> I mean, I Dr. Fernando I don't Arroyo. Find the Okay, we got a couple. Okay, so let's go with uh, Mr. Patterson and then let's go with Mr. Arroyo. Thanks, yeah. guys. Uh, I'll, you know, I, I'll let Fernando if he wants to expand on this, but the, the problem we have, uh, and I think that uh, Ms. Walter said that the best, the biggest issue we have right now is about numbers, and we are not receiving as a community enough numbers. What everybody has to remember is that every vaccine that comes into the Waco McLennan County area has been designated for a specific grouping of people. And it was, it was designed by the CDC and the federal government, as well as blessed by the state of Texas. The, the initial vaccines and where we are right now are all in the category of only 1A and 1B. That's it. The, pro, the, per, the public health department, uh, Hillcrest, uh, the... Uh, FQHC, uh, Family Health Center, as well as Ascension Providence are the four main vehicles for these vaccines. 
vaccines for 1A personnel were specifically designed and designated for those healthcare workers on the front lines taking care of our community. Um, we can define that any way we want, but it wouldn't change what the state or the, the federal government is. And as the mayor has pointed out on most of his press conferences, Governor Abbott has specifically said that we are not to deviate from his governmental structure and his design on how everything is done at the state level. So we have to go specific on 1A. Once we feel that 1A has been appropriately requested, so not everybody is getting the vaccine, so that doesn't mean that a healthcare worker is forced to do it, we then can move into 1B. 1B is specifically secondary, uh, secondary individuals who may have at, um, have contact with individuals with COVID, but those are still very, very specifically designed uh, healthcare workers or secondary workers around, around healthcare or uh, shut-in uh, requirements. Then 1B moves into those over 65 or those with uh, specific healthcare needs that uh, can uh, remove the immunity uh, of their body and could force them to be more susceptible to COVID. That's where we are right now. We are not allowed to move out of those two definitions. With that said, I truly believe, and I think that the public health department, and I hope you get this answer, uh, Ms. Welter, tomorrow from the, from the mayor, I think you will, because I've had many conversations with him, with uh, Bradley Ford as the city manager. They are well aware and support exactly what you were just talking about. And we've been working uh, not only with our 1B because we have gotten a significant amount of a small pot, but we've got a significant amount at Ascension Providence and realize that our far reaching ability as an organization is not big enough into those areas that we're speaking to. And that's why we've been working with Dr. Griggs uh, and Dr. Ben Wilson to advocate on pushing our vaccines over to the FQHC to the Family Health Center to ensure that we are pushing as much of this uh, vaccine towards those individuals that we have specifically talked about in the Latinx and the African American communities because we know that the health disparities that have caused a lot of the uh, health issues in the communities that we're talking about have led to higher incidences of COVID being in those communities, as well as higher hospitalization rates. Uh, we're struggling with it, Ascension Providence is. We've got a high census, we've got a high COVID census, and we know that by working with our community partners in the public health department, as well as the uh, Family Health Center, is specifically how we get to those communities that are most uh, at risk. And so we're doing everything we can we want to do more. We are pushing the governor. I've got advocates at the state level pushing to get more vaccines for this community. We are still in an orange status. We have the second highest COVID population per capita of anywhere in Texas, except for one area in the community in South Texas. So we're number two, and we have the second highest hospitalization rate in the state of Texas. So both follow each other. And we're struggling and we are using those numbers to say, give us more vaccines. And we as healthcare providers, and that's not just Providence and Hillcrest, that is everyone else who is working within that. You mentioned the, the pharmacies, you mentioned uh, nursing homes. We're all working together to push our agenda to get more vaccines across our, our community. And we are all working daily. Uh, we talk three days a week as a collective uh, on how now to push out vaccines to all of our community, but especially those who are potentially at most at risk still as the COVID virus continues to go across our community. So I'll turn it over to Fernando if he wants to add some, some ideas, but it really is truly, I think some of those num early numbers that we're getting is specifically because most of them have gone to healthcare providers uh, and those at the front lines. And I guarantee you, the mayor is on the front of working with us to push those uh, vaccines out to those hardest hit communities. So thank you, uh, Ms. Walter. Keep going, uh, get it going. And uh, you've got some support from all of us in the healthcare uh, arena. I know that.
in that one B category, that would include, for example, somebody his, who is 44 years old and has, you know, type two diabetes or someone who is, who's overweight. So I don't think that, uh, the problem is all about, you know, yes, we don't have enough vaccinations. We all know that. But I also know that we have people who would qualify to get those vaccinations who, for example, um, let's say if they, they set aside the numbers for people to call on the phone, where we do have people in populations who may have a phone today and they may not have a phone tomorrow. That is, you know, they maybe, you know, couldn't pay their bill, their phone bill because they had to pay their light bill. So we have people like that. And then we know that the digital divide in McLennan County is real so that people I always think of it in this way. So let's back up from having access to the um, internet, let's back up to having a computer. Let's back up to having the lights on that day that they happen to mention that. You know, so we can back up to disparities that start there. You know, I, you know, we we do have people in the midst of COVID who have lost their jobs, who are struggling to literally keep the lights on. Therefore, they're not going to have high speed internet. They're not going to have a computer. They're not going to have access. So that there are people who are eligible to receive those shots who for the kinds of inequities that we're talking about would not have access to them. Those, those are the people that we're gonna to have to pay attention to and we're gonna to have to go to them. That is that we're going to have to go to them and figure out ways, for example, using the churches and when I say using the churches, I mean literally using the churches, but also using the pastors who can get to those people and talk to those people, uh, setting up places that, you know, we, we, we have a transportation issue in Waco as well, so that people may not even, you know, like, I know that you could go to the library to sign up, but if you can't get to the library, then you can't sign up. But in any case, these are the kinds of disparities that, we need to pay attention to, to be able to figure out ways that we can then get to those, those vulnerable populations. And then uh, Mr. Arroyo, I'm gonna let you go ahead. Sorry, I'm, I'm got on my soapbox. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, the only thing I could add is a huge thank you to, to Joe, a huge thank you to, to Dr. Peaches Henry, a huge thank you to Philip Patterson too for for the for the work that we do as a as a partner uh, with, with uh, Ascension Providence and, and Family Health Center and those in the community, it's it's um, it, it, that that it, it it is the work. Having these conversations is part of the work. Doing these uh, uh, partnerships is, is also part of the work. And and asking these hard questions and acknowledging where we're where we're where we're struggling, acknowledging where there's gaps. There is a huge gap with the way that um, appointments were accessed. And, and I acknowledge that, I recognize that, I lament that, I lament that. Uh, in addition, we gotta do better. There's a round two, right? This isn't the end of it. We have an opportunity, tomorrow's a new <laughs> day and we can get up and we can keep working and we can have a discussion. Joe, talk to the mayor. Um, uh, uh, we'll continue talking to the mayor and we're, we're gonna do, we're gonna try to do the right thing. It's important. It's 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 an it's an, an imperative. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Barron put put preach it there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, so we're gonna wrap up, and I'm going to uh, I'm gonna finish here. I'm gonna throw it back to Joe in just a minute. But please, I want to thank everyone who is attending, and I want to apologize ahead of time that we did not get to all of the questions. Uh, you all had such very uh, good, interesting questions um, for us tonight. And as always, we can never get to all of them. I want to also thank all our panelists. We are so in just grateful to you for being willing to give up your time and your expertise and talk with us about these issues. It lets us know how much you care about our communities. And we are so happy uh, to be able to talk with you. And so as we close out, I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, Joe and let her 
finish up tonight. Of course, everyone, you know that these are ongoing conversations. I want to uh, make you aware of a conversation that is going to take place on Thursday. It is a COVID conversation with a local physician, Dr. Terry Woods Campbell, and she's going to answer questions that we have about COVID. And I mean those questions that we have amongst ourselves at home. I wonder if, I wonder why. So come to that. And also, again, we will be addressing um, the inequities that we're facing here. So please do uh, come to that. Again, it'll be a Zoom meeting on Thursday uh, uh, evening as well. And we'll provide that information for you. Joe, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much. Thank you every one of you panel members for being a part of this. Thank you, Dr. Peaches, for uh, moderating this for us. Thank you, Colwyn Green, for doing the tech part of it. Um, please, if you even if you didn't get the link out of chat, um, uh, go to YouTube and, and um, search for Dr. Susan Moore. The, the end of that video that we did not see um, the whole thing was, of course, very moving, and it's even more moving when you can see this woman's face. And she recorded this short of breath and and um, really not doing well. And just a few days later, she died. Um, it's a very moving video, and it really brings home um, the 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 um, role of racism in all of this. Um, I just want to assure everyone in attendance here tonight that you as one person can make a difference. One of the things that I love about Waco is that you can really make a difference in Waco. If you are part of a community, say the DFW area or San Antonio or Houston, the cities that are bigger than we are in, in Texas, it's much more difficult to make a difference. We have leaders in our community that are very accessible it doesn't have to be just I who talks to the mayor tomorrow. It can be you. And I wanted to just close with a quote from Margaret Mead. And then I'm going to ask Colwyn to put up the flyer for this Thursday discussion, Thursday evening discussion that, that Peach has just talked about. So I wanted to close with one of my uh, favorite quotes from Margaret Mead, an anthropologist. Some of you are too young to probably even remember her, know about her. She said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. So now, Colwyn, if you can put up the um, flyer about the Thursday thing there. So this is something, uh, Peaches, am I correct? You have to pre-register for this one as well. <laughs> I don't think so. Y'all know I'm not all that technological, so I don't know. I think that oh, you, okay. oh, oh, no, 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 no. It's gonna be on channel 10. It's gonna be on channel 10. Oh, on channel other. 10, okay. Yeah, it's one of those, the city's, uh, you know, the city's TV station, if that makes any sense. I know I'm not being all technological, but y'all can probably figure that part out. So you're gonna be able to tune into this on channel 10 via Grande or Spectrum TV. And you can also do it online and that'll be through the city's TV station. And you'll just have to click live there. All of that information is on the flyer. And I encourage everyone to attend that and to send in questions because I know you have even more questions to ask. So please do let them know what, what we're thinking in the community. Great, sounds great. Thank you everyone, panel members, attendees, everyone. Take care. Thanks so much everyone. Take care.